welcome back. <clears throat> this is the day that the Lord has made. I will, we will rejoice and be glad in this day. I'm so sorry that we didn't uh, broadcast last week. We had such a busy week, a week of joy, Easter celebration, and we just got bombarded. And the next thing you know, I was, oop, I don't have time. But I thank God, I pray that you studied and that you uh, also included with this lesson here. We're just going to hit on about one or two verses from last week. But we're going to rejoice, be glad, and thank God that we're back again and that we will rightly divide His Word with His guidance. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, our lives, health, and strength. And Lord, before we begin, even to get into this lesson, this prayer, anything, Lord, that we said, done, or thought about that was not pleasing in your sight, we ask that you forgive us and remove it and to strengthen us so that we can be good vessels, pure vessels for you. Lord, we thank you for our food, our shelter, our transportation, our jobs, our income, and most of all, Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for a peace of mind and all of your benefits. We love you, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. We pray, Lord, for every country that's on the face of this earth and for every world leader. Lord, we pray for America. Lord, you know it's in your hands. And Lord, help us not to get weary. Help us not to fret, but help us to keep our eyes lifted to you, Lord, because you are our present help in the time of trouble. And I thank you, Lord, because we need not worry about this situation because you promised, Lord, that you're going to take care of us. We thank you. Bless our families, each family, Lord, our friends. And yes, Lord, help us to love, to pray and to do good even to our enemies. We pray for these things, Lord. And Lord, we're looking each and every day, Lord Jesus, for you to come and to gather your jewels. We love you, we honor you, and it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask of these things. Amen. Just want to give a shout out to some of our faithful listeners. And we... Continue to pray and to lift you up all of the sick and the shut in because we know that some people can't get out. We want to pray and we thank God also. Deacon Lynn Bidding, who went into surgery this week and he's out of surgery. He's still recuperating at the hospital. But Brother Lynn, you're going to be okay. And Sister Marie, we thank God for your faithfulness. And by, by the way, Happy birthday as well. Want to give a shout out. Happy birthday to Sister Dr. Rebecca Moore, you too. And I would just thank God for each and every one of you. Thank God for Deacon and Sister uh, Bernard and Joanne Thompson, Deacon Darnell and Deacon Nelson, Sister Meadows, Betty Watson. We thank you and we praying. Continue to pray. For little Jack and Big Jack and all of your family. We know you're in Georgia, but we know you're listening and you're praying for us. We love you and we'll just continue to pray for you. Sister Plushie Johnson and Brother Doug Narvell, we're lifting you up in prayer as well. May McManus, Sister McMillan, miss you all, but we know that your heart is there and we're praying for your recovery. Aunt Ina, Aunt Shirley, Swanny, and all of our families, all of our friends. We also want to lift up to uh, Pastor Kevin Edwards of Pine Hall. 
and his beautiful wife, Sister Charlene Edwards. We're praying for you all and your congregation. God is a healer, a healer, a healer. And I thank him for being just the kind of God that we serve. I thank God, too, for this lesson. And as I said, we missed last week's lesson. And it was coming out of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And we know we're pretty much familiar with Malachi. Um, most of the time it's read, <coughs> excuse me, every Sunday doing tithe and offering. But I just want to go over it just for a minute. And that was taken. Read the whole chapter, third chapter of Malachi when you get the opportunity. And it says this from verses uh, 7 through 10 of that book of Malachi, the third chapter. And it says, Even from the days of your father, you are gone away from mine ordinance, still disobedient, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? And then he asked a big important question. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? And tithe and offering. <coughs> and this is the penalty, y'all. Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. But he gives us the antidote. He says, bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough. To receive it. So it's up to us. How do you want to be blessed? And you don't do it because you say. Oh I want the Lord to bless me. Do it because you want to be obedient. That God's word. His ministry. Could go on. For your faithfulness. Because he said he loves. A cheerful giver. Don't give it if you're going to do it grudgingly. Because God knows your thoughts and he knows your heart. But you should do it with happiness and Lord, this is yours. Because Lord, you provided all this other stuff for me. This is just a little small portion of what I want to give back to you. Yes, a man can rob God. But we can correct it. We all have robbed him. At one time or another. But when we come into the marvelous light. Of how to give. Then we don't have to be bound. To that anymore. We don't need to be cursed. With a curse with that anymore. He said he will open up the windows. Of the storehouse. That you won't be able to receive it all. So think about it like this. If you're not going to be able to receive it all. Where is it going to go? To your children and your children and your children's children. You can be able to bless someone else. Because you'll be what? Running over. Good measure. It talks about that even in Luke. Good measure. Pressed together. Running over. And that's what we want the Lord to do for us. Amen. Amen. Now, we're moving out. Of the Old Testament. And as I was reading. I said wow. This is going. It seems like it's going backwards. Because we're just getting out of Easter. And now we're going into. Even back to when. Jesus was born. But now I understand. Is that what we're doing. We're leaving the Old Testament. And we're getting ready for. The New Testament. Our Lord and Savior. Who. Made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could even come here 
today and study his word and not have to go to a priest. Now, we need a preacher, okay? But we don't have to <clears throat> wait till somebody else pray for us. We can go directly to the throne of grace ourselves because of this little baby, little Emmanuel, Jesus Christ, was born. And it's taken from Matthew, Brother Matthew, the first book, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 through 25. <coughs> Excuse me. These allergies are really acting up, but we're going to go on in the name of the Lord. Um. And it's entitled, Emmanuel, God is with us, is born. Emmanuel is born. The name Emmanuel given to Christ is interpreted as God with us. And that's taken from Matthew, the first chapter, the 23rd verse, and Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, 8, 8, and then again, verse 10. The prophet Isaiah foretold of a savior who would be born of a virgin and would bear his name, 714. Symbolically, the name implies God's coming in earth, to earth, in human flesh. Literally, the meaning of Emmanuel refers to his dwelling among us as Jesus Christ, just as he is present today in every believer's life. 1 John 4 2. Now we're going over to, we know that little baby Jesus was born, but to a man that was also influential in his early part of his life, and that's Joseph. Joseph, a descendant of King David and the husband of Mary, Jesus' earthly mother, the mother of Jesus, was born in, born in Nazareth, a town in a region of Galilee. Joseph was the legal earthly father of Jesus. He was a carpenter by trade and a righteous man. Matthew 1 19. After Mary was found to be with child, the angel of the Lord instructed Joseph to marry her. Even though Jew Jewish law regarding her pregnancy would have justified an opposite choice. Joseph obeyed the angel's bidding. Joseph is last mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, in the Bible when Jesus is only 12 years old. He may have died before Jesus' public ministry. And that's in Matthew, first chapter, 19 to 25. And then the 13th chapter, verses 55. The book of Matthew. It's called the Jewish Gospel because its intended audience is Jewish. It is rooted in Old Testament prophecy related to the coming king through the lineage of King David. In the first chapter of Matthew, the author presents Jesus' royal lineage, describing his kingly line and rightful place as heir to the throne of David. Although Mary was a descendant <coughs> excuse me, of David through the house of Nathan, the legal inheritance had to come through the line of Solomon. Through Joseph's earthly, through Joseph, Jesus' earthly father, Luke 3.23 and 4.22, Jesus' lineage Proved that he had the right to be called the king of the Jews, the son of David, and the son of Abraham. Jesus was conceived. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, which gave him the right to be called the son of God. Matthew 1, 18-25. He was fully God and fully human. He was the living word who came down from heaven, clothed in human flesh, and dwelt among men. 
John 1, 1 through 4, Luke 1, 26 through 35, and the second chapter, 1 through 7. His virgin birth fulfilled the prophetic utterance of Isaiah, Isaiah 7, 14. The name Jesus is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Jehoshua, which means the Lord saves. The sinless and divine nature of Jesus made him the only man capable of shedding divine blood on the cross and becoming the final, the final atonement for humankind's sin. So Jesus, he is his blood is the one that saved us. Not in the blood of any animal or human blood. And you know, we have people say, oh, I'll die for you. Yeah, you could do that. But it won't save your soul. Only Jesus' blood was capable of doing that. And with that, we're going to start our first couple of segments. We're going to do one and two of Matthew, first chapter, verses 18 and 19. And those are in verses 18, it's entitled, Fathered by the Holy Spirit. And two, faced a dilemma. It reads like this. <coughs> and as we say, Father by the Holy Spirit. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on the wise when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately. And this is saying this. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. Uh -huh. His mother Mary, she was already engaged to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, before any kind of intimacy took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Joseph, who was her fiance, he was a good man and did not want to embarrass her publicly. So he decided to quietly break their engagement. And we can understand you saying this is this has never happened before. And <coughs> You engage to somebody, and then they come and say, Oh, I'm going to have a baby. But I haven't known anybody else. You're the only one. I would say, What? So he had reasons to have some doubt. Because this has never happened before. And for the woman that you love, that you're intending to spend the rest of your life with, tell you that I'm pregnant and it's not by you or any other man. I'm sure that Mary has some thoughts and I know that Joseph did. But God knows what he's doing and how he's going to work this thing out. The virgin birth of Jesus is crucial to Christianity as the Son of God. He could not be tainted by sin. And all of our blood, all of our human blood is tainted with sin because of Adam. He was born out of a woman's womb which made him fully human yet was fathered 
by the Holy Spirit, which made him fully God. Beside God was Jesus' father. Jesus was born with the characteristics of God. Had Joseph been his sole father, Jesus would have been born with the sinful characteristic passed down from Adam. However, because God was his father, Jesus could rightfully claim his position as the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Fulfilling the prophecies in the scripture. Born fully man as well, Jesus was able to experience every aspect of human life and was touched by every human emotion, yet was without sin. Hmm. His life experience helped him develop empathy for human suffering. And he was able to give grace, thank you Lord, to the hurting through genuine love and compassion. Jesus born fully God was given the authority to forgive human sin and reconcile humankind to God. Colossians, second chapter, Verses 13 to 15 in Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 15 to 16. Now, God, Jesus, being too fully God, when he became flesh, he did not sin. He still maintained his characteristics of his Father, God the Father, who could not sin. But he allowed the human aspect to be part of him too. He was a man of sorrow. He was acquainted with grief. He came in human form for us to identify with us. So he knew what it meant to hurt and, and all these emotions that we have <coughs> because he wanted to have empathy for us. So when we go through things and we think, oh Lord, I'm going through it. Jesus can say, I went through that too. But I went through that for you because I'm acquainted. I know all of these things because I took those things on myself. When I became man for your benefit. I thank God. I thank God. Our third segment and our fourth one would be from um, the same chapter, the th third chapter, first chapter, I'm sorry, and it's verses 20 and 21. 20 would be forfeited a decision and 21 would be follow God's instruction. Amen. And it reads like this. And we're still talking now about Brother Joseph after he received the news from Mary that she's with child. God knows when there's a situation and we were troubled about things. He knows just how to get us to know that he's still with us. And God does this with Joseph. It says in verse 20 of the first chapter of Matthew, But while he thought on these things, Joseph, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, <coughs> excuse me, in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto, unto thee Mary thy wife, 
For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. <coughs> Isn't that a great thing? So as he considered this thing that was taking place in he and Mary's relationship, thinking about it, how am I going to break this door? How am I going to get out of this without her being uh, ashamed or either stoned to death? Because they didn't play back then. He was thinking about those things. As he was doing this, <clears throat> an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David. So, he called him, not only Joseph, but he let him know, I know about you. I know about your lineage. I know about your people. So Joseph, not just Joseph, but Joseph, you're the son of David. Let me tell you some things. The angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she shall have a son. And you are you, Joseph. Not Mary, but you, Joseph. Or to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Ain't God good? Now Mary is with child. Joseph is a little, no, Joseph is a lot of concern. <laughs> because he know that this is not his job. He had no job in conceiving this child. But God sent his messenger to tell him that this baby, this child that's growing in Mary is not by anybody human. It's from the Holy Spirit, directed from God, the Father, to use Mary, a virgin girl on this earth, to carry his Holy Son in her womb to be birthed. And you, Joseph, are not to do away with her, but you are to marry her as planned. You are to marry her. And I want you, Joseph, not only to marry her, but I'm going to give you a job too, so that you can feel a part of it too. You name the baby. You name the baby. Joseph, you shall call him Jesus. God we use us. And sometimes we think our worth is not even worth talking about. But when we have a purpose to serve God and do it for God's glory, God will let us be a part of His ministry. We're not worthy, really. I'm not worthy, really. To even go into this lesson. But it's in my heart. The Lord, I want to be used by you. I want to get your word out. So somehow, some way, through the Holy Spirit, he puts it there. Because I'm nothing. But he has all power. And he's everything. I'm just a vessel. You're just a vessel. And David, not, I'm sorry, Joseph, a heeded to his word. He did not fuss when the angel told him what was going on with Mary. He was obedient to do just that. And don't we want to do that? We want to please God. We try to please everybody else. 
But let's try to please God. Because He is the one who is the first and the final say. In Jewish customs, marriage consists of three important steps. First, the families of the intended couple agree to the marriage. Second, when an agreement was made, the man and the woman became pledged or so to each other, <clears throat> somewhat beyond the expectation of a modern day engagement, <clears throat> and publicly announced their intentions to marry. Third, the couple formally married and lived together as man and wife. According to the Jewish law, when Joseph discovered that Mary was pregnant and the child was not his, he had every right to divorce her, to break it off. Mary's condition violated marital laws and was deemed unacceptable in Jewish society. Giving Jewish authorities the right to stone her to death Deuteronomy 22, 23 to 24. Joseph's action speaks volumes about the character of Mary. No matter how bizarre her story must have sounded, there was something, something about her character that provoked his love and the desire to protect her reputation. Throughout their relationship, Mary must have exhibited the characteristics of a woman who loved and worshipped the Lord. So much so that she was highly favored in the eyes of God. And God chose her to be the mother. God chose her to be the mother of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Luke 1, 26-35 And as we said before, Joseph was a righteous man and he struggled to make the right decision. Faced with this dilemma of marriage unexpected pregnancy, Joseph was forced to make a choice that would affect his and Mary's life. Should he divorce the woman he loved or leave her to face public humiliation. He decided to divorce her privately, thinking it would protect her from public disgrace. If Joseph was trying to avoid humiliation, he knew that Mary and Mary, and Mary would create even greater suffering. In Jewish society, Mary's condition constituted constitu adultery and justified punishment by stoning. Mary and her will bring even greater disgrace to his family since the baby was not biologically his. Joseph also speaks volumes about his own character and upbringing. His behavior demonstrated the ability to exercise discretion and sensitivity. He was sensitive to Mary's needs and sought to do the right thing in the eyes of God by not publicly assassinating her reputation. Mm. He practiced discretion when he chose to divorce Mary privately and not make her a public spectacle. No doubt, Joseph felt hurt and betrayed by the situation. Yet in spite of his own feelings, he wanted to carry out what he thought was the best solution. God did not leave the situation in Joseph's hand. 
knowing Joseph's plan to divorce Mary, God intervened immediately by sending an angel to him in a dream. The angel told Joseph not to fear to take Mary as his wife, for the child she was carrying was of, was of the Holy Spirit. No matter how good <clears throat> our intentions appear to be, when God has a plan for us, we are going. God has a plan for us, and we are going in the wrong direction. He will quickly, amen, disrupt our plans and steer us in the right direction. Joseph had an important role to play in making sure Mary's pregnancy came to fruition. Sometimes God will lead us into a situation that brings hardship, embarrassment, and humiliation into our lives. However, remembering that God is sovereign will help us to understand that God chooses only the best solution, the one that will produce the best outcome in our lives. He uses all of our situations to work for our good. Romans 8, 28. So God told him, go ahead. This is a good thing. And I thank God. God was still looking out, especially for his son and for Mary and for Joseph. He still used them to bring his child into this world. And for them, isn't it an honor for God to say, I trust you with my child. I want you to be over this. And he did this with Mary and Joseph and letting Jesus be born to them. But he's saying now that we're saved. I trust you because we should be carrying the word on the inside of us. I trust you to spread it to others. I trust you to help others because you're representing me. You're part of me. And I know sometimes there are going to be disappointments. There are going to be heartaches. There's going to be a lot of work. But if you're doing for it for God's glory, as it said in Romans, it said that, that we know he will use our situations to work everything out for the good. Joseph didn't feel good when Mary told him that she was expecting. And he knew he wasn't a father. And as we just read, it was a disgrace. And you say, well, why didn't they... Well, get married right then. But you know what? <laughs> Came to me and we're going to get ready to conclude it. I believe God allowed his son to be born like that because so many of us were born like that. God is a forgiving God. And I want to say this. No child. No child. Is a mistake. If your mother and father. Were not married. Just like God told. That woman who was caught. In the very acts of adultery. If you're in that situation now. Love your child. 
Have your child. And sin no more. Sin no more. That child may be the only child you have who may be able to help you. It may be the only child that can be able to point someone else to glory. And I thank God that my mother let me come forth. I thank God for that. In her latter days, I had to be her eyes and things for her. But if she had not let me come, I wouldn't have been there because I was the only child she ever had. But I thank God that she taught me, she told me the truth about herself. And she told me, don't you go through this. That's why I'm telling you at a very young age, that's why I want you to give your life to Christ at a very young, young age so that you can have the goddess. When I can't be there, God is always there. And I thank God for that. If you are a single parent, whether you're male or female, raise your child in Christ. Because God gave you that child. That child it's not a mistake. The mistake comes when that child grows up and doesn't accept Christ as their personal Savior. The mistake is you who have not accepted Christ as your personal Savior. That's, mis that's the mistake. But God is a mistake corrector. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to go there. Today is the day. Heart, not your heart. Okay, we're going to go on with this and conclude it in verses 23. I'm sorry, 22 to 23. 23 says, fulfill prophecy. And then we're going to go on to 20, excuse me, 24 and 25, which it says, fulfill promise. Amen. So 22 says, Now all this, what this, was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, so this was already foretold. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And 24 says, then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. And she knew, and he knew, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn child. And he called his name. Jesus. <coughs> so when Joseph got up, he said, let's go get married. We're going to get married. And they did. And he went with her through that pregnancy. And he knew her physically, not as a husband yet, until that baby was born. So, no human contamination was done to Jesus while he was growing inside his mother. Joseph married her so that she could be a just woman too. She already was because she was a virgin 
she was a woman of God, but for the public's sake, he didn't want her to be embarrassed or looked down on. He married her, but he did not touch her physically until after our Lord and Savior was born. That's an awesome job. And it says, Joseph's role was crucial. He would be responsible for protecting young Jesus and raising him in the things of God. He would play a crucial role in assisting God in bringing forth the promises he made to his people. The name Jesus, the name Jesus, is the Greek form of the name Joshua, which means the Lord saves. God deserves to save, desired to serve his people from hopelessness and sin. Sin is innate in every human being, and only through <clears throat> The shed blood of Jesus could human man be redeemed from the devastating and final consequences of sin through Jesus' blood. There is no real evidence <clears throat> that Joseph fully understood what the angel meant when he said that Jesus would save the people from their sins. Joseph may have believed that Jesus would be a king who would one day lead with a fearless army of Jewish soldiers pounding down the doors of oppressive enemies. Unknown to Joseph, Jesus would not come as a mighty, typical, imagined water, warrior, but as a humble man going about his father's business forgiving people of their sins and then he would be handed over to the enemy and crucified on a cross for it is at the cross where our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed his precious blood that we are given total victory over sin and death the cross represents the final atonement for human man fallen stake. Jesus taking on the sin of humankind, he endured the cross for our sake. Anyone who believes, repents, and accepts him as Lord and Savior is forgiven of sin, reconciled back to God. And given the gift of eternal life. God's word was manifested in the lives of his people. It had been a long awaited prophecy. And now the people were finally experiencing the truth of God's word. The word of God is true. And never return to him accomplishing it's intended purpose. So if you're witnessing and it feels like it's falling on deaf ears, deaf ears, it's not. Not the word of God. It's too powerful. They may act like they don't hear, but it will resonate somewhere, sometime, and hopefully before it's too late. God speaks through human beings. And uses us to fulfill his promise. However, our obedience or disobedience to God's word cannot thwart the, the will of Almighty God. When God sets in motion the fulfillment, fulfillment of a promise, it is fulfilled regardless of people's 
dim understanding of the outcome. Isaiah 55, 11. The word Emmanuel means God with us. Matthew 1, 23. The prophet Isaiah predicted that God would live among the people. Isaiah 7, 14. Jesus, being God in human flesh, would dwell among the people and live a simple life. He would work as a carpenter like his earthly father Joseph and not perform public ministry <coughs> until the appropriate time. God still dwells among his people in the form of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He lives in the heart of believers. Amen. God is an ever-present help as he promised. He will never leave or forsake us. He is always with us. Joshua 1 5, Psalms 46 1, and Hebrew 13 5. And our conclusion the fulfilled promise. Joseph believed God's messenger and immediately, immediately obeyed the spoken word. He forfeited his decision to divorce Mary and instead he took her to be his wife. Joseph probably faced opposition from his family, but despite their disapproval, he obeyed God's command. There would be times, amen, in our lives when God would tell us to make a decision that appears to others as wrong or unpopular. <coughs> Excuse me. Our ultimate goal is to please God and not one another. As we follow God's instruction, the Lord can fulfill His purpose for our lives. God knows our future. And to trust God means to follow His instructions for us. Joseph reverenced the Lord and respected his wife. And unlike what would have occurred under normal circumstances, their marriage was not consummated until after the birth of Jesus. God gives us the strength to deal with every unusual, difficult situation. He provides sufficient grace to enable us to obey. Yes, Lord. His commands, no matter what difficulties we might face, Joseph followed the commandment of God and Joseph named the child Jesus because of his obedience. And as I said, he probably had some people in his family or even his friend, you gonna do what? You did what? But when God tells you to do something, do it. Just do it. My mind just went back just now. I'm not gonna tell the whole story because I don't wanna leave anything out. But I remember one of Jesus' first miracles when he was at that wedding. And they ran out of wine. <coughs> and Mary went to him and said, Jesus, we're out of wine. She knew the power of her son. And he said, woman, what would you have me to do? And she kind of left him. And she said, she gave the instructions to the people. Whatever he say, do it. 
knew her boy. She knew her son. And she told them, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. Because she knew he would follow through. And I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, Lord, whatever you ask me to do, want me to do, help me to just do it. Because you know the whole story. You know the beginning. You know before he even started. You know the beginning, the middle, and the end. And you have always guided me in the right direction. It was my fault when I went in the wrong direction and had to call for you to help me to get back on track. It was my fault, but you gave me the instructions. It was my disobedience. So now, Lord, whatever you want me to do, help me, Holy Spirit, to just do it. And you do it, what God tells you to do. Because he's not going to lead you in a path of unrighteousness. He's too holy. He can't do that. We serve a sovereign God. God who's over everything. Who can never make any fault. Who has never failed. Who always have the answer. Because he created. He made. He architect. He did all of this. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. So why aren't you going to follow? Why are we so hard-headed and not following the one who made everything? And we don't know anything comparing to God. So Joseph, after the angel told him, it's okay. This is a divine gift from God. This is the Holy Spirit. Say Joseph immediately raised from his bed and he married Mary. He just did it. And when that baby was born, Joseph named him Jesus. You shall call him Joseph. Jesus. God saves. And I thank God that we say that we are saved by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And that we don't have to worry anymore. We're no longer bound. No more chains holding us. Because we're free through the precious blood of Jesus. I pray that you have gotten something out of this lesson. I thank God. I thank God. He's a mighty God. He's a good God. And if you don't know God as your personal Savior, you can do it right now. Just accept, believe, and confess. The ABC. Accept, believe, and confess. Accept that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. Believe on Jesus Christ, that he was born. He walked this earth. He taught. He preached. He healed. He delivered. He set free and he saved. Believe that. He died. And most of all, that he got up. And he shed his precious blood for you on Calvary. And he got up with all power in his hand. And confess that, Lord, I need you. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. In need of you, Lord. If you do that, you are saved. Get into a Bible teaching and preaching church 
that preaches and teaches Jesus Christ. He's the only way. There is no other way to heaven but through Christ. And those who are in the backslidden way, repent, get up, and get back out there. God is waiting, patiently waiting. But God does get tired sometimes. Don't wait too long. Don't wait too long. Do it now. And as we see, just do it. Just do it. Our next week lesson is God's will. It's taken from Mark. <coughs> and as I said, we're getting over the Easter holidays. But that's okay. We're going to learn about what these events and things are about that we just celebrated. Hosanna. That's the title. Hosanna. And I thank God for that. And it's taken from Mark, the uh, 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. So that's for the next week's lesson. Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. So I pray that all is well. All will be well. Continue to fight the good fight of faith and just do it. Whatever the Lord wants you to do. I want to say thank you, Nicole, for making this possible. God bless you. God bless you. And thank you, honey, Pastor William Brown, for making this possible and making sure that I'm in the right light. And he's very meticulous about those things. I just want to get the word out. But I thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your concern. And I thank you for listening. For us coming together. So that we can grow together in Christ. Continue to pray for us. Pray for this ministry. And Lord, in your name, Jesus, I pray that it go out. And I don't know who it touched. But I know it would touch someone. That your word will go and penetrate. I may not ever see it on this face of the earth. And if I don't, that's okay. Hopefully we'll see each other in heaven. And we can tell each other how we had this time. I may never know you now. But if you're saved, I'll know you in glory. God bless you. And again, I pray. And lift up all the sick, to shut in all the ministers, all the churches, universally. Because we need God. If we ever need Him, we need Him at such a time as this. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. And God bless you. Until the next time. Bye-bye.